Welcome to San Joaquin Spotlight, a public affairs program featuring conversations about life in the central San Joaquin Valley. This program is brought to you in partnership between KFSR 90.7 FM and CMAC Fresno. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. Today we're excited to have Nick Bellardis. He is an author and he does a lot of creative things. He's actually from Bakersfield. Nick, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me here. We have this problem between us called the Highway 99, but I'm glad I got here. I mean, thank, it, took, it took a while. Thank you for coming. Last time I had you on the program, it was at the radio studio. Yeah, so. you've changed it. Look at this. <laughs> this is great. Things are different. We're now on TV, and I'm glad you can make it to the studio. First time we've met in person. Yes, first time. I want to ask, although I've, I feel like I've known you forever, by the way. Oh, I think it's been, what, three years since three. since our first interview? So we've known each other through social media since then. Yeah, and I'm going to ask you about social media because when it comes to social media, one thing I've noticed about you is that you're good and you post some creative things on there. But first, let's tell our audience who you are. You're an author, and what else do you do? Well, I used to do all kinds of things from being a journalist. I used to work for an ABC affiliate. I've worked in marketing for corporations. I've taught history at Bakersfield College. So I've done all kinds of things. But now now I try to focus my career on writing and seeing if I could really make, even though I've had jobs as a creative writer and got paid as a writer, I'm really trying to make it as a poet, a novelist, and a memoirist now. So. That, you know, any artist who's out there who's trying to make it as an artist, which basically means, I, if for me, can you make a living doing it? So that's what I'm focused on now. And talk about if it's possible to make a living writing. Oh, I think it is. Uh, I think it depends what kind of writing you want to do. Uh, I used to be a creative writer uh, for the Fremont Street Experience in Las Vegas. So that was one of the first creative writing jobs I, I've had. As a journalist, you can make it as a writer, definitely. I mean, even though the, me the news industry is changing, media is transforming, there's, there are always jobs to you can write. But making it as a novelist, well, that's you know, that's still to be decided. That's that's a hard road and it takes it can take a really long time. So is it harder given the fact that you're in a smaller town? I mean, every time you think of like art, you think of New York or you think of Los Angeles or some of the bigger cities. You're from Bakersfield. How has that impacted you? Well, we talked a little bit about this before the show that uh, it's my belief that you can succeed as a writer from from anywhere. You're going to have to be driven, self-driven, self-motivated. You're going to have to be extremely determined and you're going to have to put up with, uh, if you're from a small town that doesn't have a literary community, you're going to have to put up with creative, well, well I should say you should find creative ways to, to build a creative community or to tap into one because because in order to be successful, I think as a novelist, as a writer, I think you have to tap into those big creative communities that are out there for things like uh, people who are going to critique your work and, and do a good job of it so that your work grows. Uh, uh, how are you learning how to grow as a writer? Where are you taking classes from or, or what kind of people are mentoring you? Uh, all those things need to happen in order for you to really succeed as a writer. And you have to make all kinds of connections in the publishing world and things like that. It can happen from anywhere. And especially because of technology, you can, you can live in a town way smaller than Bakersfield and submit a publication over, over email through Submittable or something like that, which is a, one of the common ways to submit short stories, for instance. You can submit no novels through email. I mean, remember the days of paper? Right. <laughs> those, are kind of, those are kind of going away. A lot of publishers only want uh, email submissions. So you can, do, you can become a writer from anywhere. Talk about the connections that you mentioned earlier. I mean, how important are they really in your line of work? Well, I think they're everything. As you know, I just hosted an event here in, here in Fresno at the Fresno Art Museum. Yes, at the Fresno uh, Art Museum. Uh, Tim Hernandez uh, book release for Manana Means Heaven. And that connection is, is, to me, is hugely important because it's connecting Bakersfield to Fresno. It's not just connecting a person to a person. It's connecting a writing scene to a write writing scene. 
So there are some writers in Bakersfield, but there are an awful lot of writers in Fresno. There's an MFA program at, at Fresno State. There are creative writing professors who teach at Fresno City College. There are, are uh, and that includes poets and nonfiction writers and fiction writers. So there's this huge community in Fresno of writers. So for somebody like me from Bakersfield, to be able to connect to a, to a Tim Hernandez, even though he lives in Boulder, Colorado now, it helps, it not only helps me as an individual, it helps the entire Valley literary scene. It helps uh, connect people through me, through Tim. And I've, I've met some of the best people uh, who are writers here in Fresno. Some of my best friends who are, who are writers are here in, in Fresno. Michael Medrano, Brian Medina, uh, somebody like Lee, Lee Herrick, or Mary Saul Baca. Um, I, I could just keep, I can name even more, more names uh, of people I've connected to because community is so important. And those poets come down, and, and people like Bonnie Hearn Hill and Larry Hill too, who come down to Bakersfield to do readings because we've connected. And you know, when you get a book published and you want people to come to your readings, why not connect to other writers? There's some, there, we're each other's biggest fans. Does this have anything to do with the random workshops? I mean, I remember that I saw a post from your Facebook page, by the way, you have to tell our audience about your Twitter and Facebook pages. Why don't you go ahead and do that now? Okay, well, social media has been really important to me. Uh, when I worked for KERO, which is an ABC affiliate in Bakersfield, I started writing a Twitter novel, and it was the first Twitter novel uh, in the world. Twitter novel? Twitter novel. I wrote a novel using social media <laughs> as a tool, as a publishing tool, and uh, that that really took off all over the world. So I've, I've tried to be innovative with social media. I've tried to always not ignore it. So Twitter, I've tried to keep up. Facebook, I keep up. You know, I'm on Pinterest and things like that too. But social media is hugely important to what I do. And then in those communities we talk about, so I started this workshop in 2009, Random Writers Workshop. Yeah, and I saw you post something about that. And yeah. I, I was wondering what that was. So it's a workshop for, it's a community workshop, so it's for the public. We you know we, we started off charging 10 bucks, now we charge 15 bucks. And we started off at Russo's Books in Bakersfield, and we moved to the university, and now, now we're, we run out of this little place called the Society for Disabled Children who gives us a free workspace. And over the course of this few years that we've been operating, we met this community, great writing community in Fresno, became friends with My Michael Madrano. And Michael Madrano, who he's a professor, he's an MFA student uh, from, I think he went to the University of Minnesota. And uh, I approached him one day and said, hey, why don't you teach some random writers workshops? Uh, I won't get any kickback. You just make the money off of it. We b help build a literary scene and we help teach people creative writing who people who may not be able to afford going to an MFA program or something like that. And so he runs a random writers workshop of Fresno out of hashtag. And so you can find, you can find us on, on Facebook. Uh, you type in random writers workshop and you're going to find us and you can connect. When did you decide this is what you want to do? I mean, you've been writing for a while, so you obviously had to have a point in your life where you said, this is the direction I want to go. Oh boy, that was, um, now I have to reach really far back in the <laughs> data, data banks now. Uh, you know, that goes back to college, even before college. I wanted to become a painter. And I was a, a painter. I was wanted to become a painter. So I've I've even illustrated a book uh, called West of Here. It's a novel by Jonathan Evison that made the New York Times bestseller list. So I still dabble in art, uh, but for some reason, maybe it was the birth of my children. I see one of my children sitting over there. Yeah, he's and, in the uh, studio as and, we speak. And things changed. I went and worked in some factories and whatnot. And I thought, you know, I think I'd rather become a writer. So it's still art, and this was back in the late '80s. And so I really started studying writing. And then I did something weird. I got a degrees in history. I thought that would help my writing in a unique way, and it has. Um, but that, so that, you know, it's been, what, 20, 25 years I've been wanting to become a writer, you know, still, still wanting in a way. And I think that kind of determination and fire, if you want to be something, sometimes it's hard to take on that identity. You just have to keep wanting it so that you're still driven if that makes any sense. It does, it does. And in a little bit, I'm gonna show the audience an actual book that I'm holding in my left hand right now. But before we get into that book, you have another book that we talked about three years ago when you were on the program, and it was about random obsessions. 
Yeah, it's a, it was a book of oddities. And the cool thing about that book, Random Obsessions, and that was published by Viva Editions, which you can still buy copies of that. Uh, but that book is going through a whole cool transformation. And now it's going to, going to be called People's History of the Peculiar. And it's some, some kind of crazy <laughs> title like Astounding Facts and Oddities. And uh, I don't know, it has a, some crazy subheading on it. And that book's coming out in 2014, probably around April Fool's Day. And I'll be going on a book tour. I'll be at like the LA Times Festival of Books. I'll probably come to Fresno. I'll do a little book tour through California, maybe parts of Texas. I've been going to Texas a lot. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's, I won't have to do any new writing for it. I wrote a preface for it, but uh, I didn't have to do any other new writing for it. I got Carolyn Levitt, who's a New York Times bestselling author, to write a foreword for it. So Congratulations a lot of on that. A lot of people are, are really, you know the people who are most excited about that book coming out? Are, are authors because I started I started um, sharing it with authors wanting to get some new endorsements for it. Authors are so excited about it. Laura Zeeland, who writes uh, young adult fiction, Lee Herrick blurbed it. Um, uh, gosh, I can all kinds of all kinds of people. Rich Ferguson and all, lots of writers from all all over are, are excited about it. So I hope readers are excited about it too. So here's the book. It's called Sons of the Glue Machine Machines. Talk about when you wrote this book. So Songs of the Glue Machines is a book of poetry that just came out through a micro press out of Long Beach called Lummox Press, which is run by this really interesting guy named Rain Dog. That's his nickname, Rain Dog. He's this grizzled old poet. Rain Dog. He's this Inter grizzled old <laughs> poet. And he publishes lots of, um, lots of folks. And we did a really unique thing with this book is, is Rain Dog loves poetry and loves publishing people so much that he... He's, he's disabled himself, and so he puts a lot of his energy into publishing po poets. And so we did a whole fundraiser to help offset publishing costs for this book in particular. And I wrote this, I think, over the course of the last two years, maybe. And in fact, Tim Hernandez, who I mentioned earlier, really helped me with this manuscript. He looked at an early version of, of this. And so it's based on the years I worked in factories. Songs of the Glue Machines. Glue Machines were some of the, the factory mechanisms that I worked on. Um, I fed paperboard into them, and that was my job for 12 hours a day, six days a week. And I worked in factories for two and a half years, and I really felt like this, was an, this is an experience I need to write about. But it took 25 years for me to get to that point where, you know, I feel like I can write about those experiences from when I was 19, 20 years old working in factories and kind of bring a whole new perspective to that. So that's where that's coming from. What advice would you give someone who has a book out? I mean, we have a crew member named Gary Kennedy who's probably shaking his head right now because I mentioned his name, but he's got a book out and several other people I know have books out. And so what advice would you give them? I mean, you know, if, if they just wrote the book. Well, if you wrote the book and it's not published, then my advice is to keep editing until you feel like it's reached this point where you can submit it to publishers uh, or you share it with a peer group who can help critique it and help help provide you opportunities with areas to expand the book or things maybe to take out the publishing industry it's hard to break into uh, but for instance that book of poetry is with a micro press mm -hmm. so that's not a huge press or you know it's 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 a it's a small one it's it doesn't mean that everybody who can't get published with a bigger press should try to approach a smaller press. You know, Rain Dog and I are friends, and so there were some <laughs> opportunities to grow together there. Um, but my, my advice is not to give up. There's a lot of rejection in the industry. We writers are sensitive people. We may, I, it may be good advice to say have tough skin, <laughs> and it's true. But we're still sensitive people. But if you're determined, if you want to make it as a writer, you can't give up. You have to find really interesting places to submit to, find the right publisher who publishes similar kind of books to yours, and don't give up. Write, great, write a great query letter. You've got to really be able to develop those. Build your fan base because publishers want you to have a fan base. They want you to be on social media. They want you to be on Twitter and Facebook and those things now. So sometimes those things make the difference. If a publisher has submissions and has three very similar books they love and yours is the book that you're not on social media but these other two people are they might go with the people who are on social media because they have an author platform they can reach a fan base yeah. and because then it becomes about sales right? and it makes sense and so if 
if someone does have a book out that's already published, what then? Well, then you've got to promote. <laughs> you know, then you got to come on TV shows and promote and radio shows and promote and find unique ways to get the word out. Um, you know, you've got to you've got to pound the pavement. Uh, the guy I mentioned earlier who wrote West of Here, uh, Jonathan Evison, I like to consider him one of the biggest hustlers in the publishing industry because he didn't get an MFA. And he had a lot of uh, hardships, and he, you know, I think he says it's something like he buried four novels in the backyard or something like that until he started having success. But he continued to meet people, to build his fan base, to not give up. And I think it's that kind of resiliency you have to have. It, being any kind of an artist, you can't give up, and you have to keep have, creating goals for yourself. Uh, new things you can achieve as a writer so that you can feel successful and be successful. So do you eventually hit one out of the park? I mean, let's say you have an author that has written five or six books that hasn't done too well. Is it possible for like the eighth one or the ninth one or the twelfth one to go out of the park? Well, what I hear is it takes about four books to hit one out of the park. So I'm, ho I'm actually hoping my, the novel I'm working on now is going to be hit out of the park. I mean, that's... And I, I don't want that to sound egocentric, but I feel like I've been writing 25 years. I finally feel like the novel I'm working on now is the novel that's going to be a sort of a breakthrough novel for me. It's, it's a novel set in Bakersfield uh, called Big Spoon, Little Spoon that I've been working on. Interesting title again. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I call it, it's kind of sort of a mashup between Beasts of the Southern Wild and the, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. It's a very dark story. And, uh, and I have an agent now, and, you know, so, so I feel like, you know, that would be around my fourth book, so it would kind of fit that sort of theory. Uh, but who knows what will happen? You know, maybe it'll get picked up by a smaller press, or maybe it will get picked up by a, a larger press, which is my hope. You know, uh, reaching a higher tier is, is if you're really determined as a writer, I think it can happen. I think it can happen for me. I think it could happen for uh, anybody who's determined and keeps working on their craft. So, so eight to ten books. I hope it doesn't take anybody that long. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of frustration if you if it's eight to ten books and you're not quite reaching your goal yet. But you know what? If somebody doesn't reach their goal in eight to ten books, I hope they're still trying. And is it possible? Is my question. I mean, is this the type of thing where yeah. you know, if you have a professional athlete and they strike out every time they go up to bat, chances are a team's not going to pick them up. But something like this, is it possible to write 10, not do so well, and then the 11th one be this incredible thing? Well, it still depends on whether the thing is incredible or not. So, so let's, ho let's you know, we're just kind of playing with numbers here and this whole I idea. Uh, yeah, I think it can happen. I think it can happen for anybody. Sometimes it takes longer for people to develop in whatever they're doing. Sports is different because your body is going to sort of reach this arc and eventually <laughs> you're not going to be the same athlete you once were and maybe your agent didn't make the right connections for you as a semi-pro so that you can reach the major leagues and whatever you're doing. I don't think writing is the same way, although it could be. I mean, I've heard a few horror stories, but I'd like to think that the average guy who wants to make it as a writer is just not going to give up and keep doing it until it happens. How many times do you write something before you say, okay, it's ready for pub being published. I mean, probably I imagine it takes several times. Oh, hundreds of, of moments of revision within a story and different parts of a story uh, sometimes need even more revision. Some parts need even less. Uh, you know, I finish a, a first draft and then I'm gonna go through the same draft dozens and dozens of times. And in our workshop right now, we're talking about openings in, in short stories and novels. For me, openings are the part that I'm going to work on almost the most because you got to have that hook on the opening line. You've got to have this whole, we talk about things like, what are you promising the reader? Well, they're going to find that in the opening where they're going to find the DNA of the whole rest of the story just within that opening. So you have to have that opening done really, really well. So in a way, I, I think I spend way more time on openings than in anything else. Way, way too much. I lose sleep over openings. Where do you write? Sometimes we hear people have a nice desk that they sit at. Some people, you know, overlooking the, the prairie, stuff like that. Where do you write? I'm going to give a shout out to my friend, dear friend, Melinda Carroll, 
who uh, I write a lot in her house, on her couch, at her kitchen table. Have you taken a picture? Because I've, I thought I saw I, you. As I, <laughs> I may have. You've seen a big wooden table? Right. Big, I've long seen that. Table. Uh, sometimes I write there. I just spent a few months in San Marcos, Texas, at Texas State University, and I wrote for many weeks, uh, every, every weekday, I would go to this place called, I think it's Boca's Living Room, which is in the student union at Texas State University. And it's a really interesting place to write because it was the darkest place on campus. It wasn't in the library where it was very well lit. It wasn't uh, anywhere where there were a lot of people around. Boca's living room was kept very dark. And the, the, so the lights are very dim. There are lots of couches and little cubbies where you could go write. I loved going there to write because there wasn't anybody to bother me. I could just get lost in my own world, whether I had headphones on or not. So that, that was one of my favorite places. I've, I've, I've written on trains. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Starbucks, we talked about coffee houses. Uh, there was uh, lots of coffee houses, Starbucks. I remember Mocha's and Java's in San Marcos and going to write in uh, Austin, at Texas recently at Fairbean Coffee. So I, I remember getting a lot done there. So wherever I can sort of get into that writing trance, that writing mentality, if I can't find it wherever I'm at, then, then forget it, I can't, I can't write there. Is there a period of time or day that you write better. I mean, I've had authors in the in the program before, and one gentleman said he has to when he wakes up, four in the morning. He writes from four thirty to five thirty, and that's it. He's done. For you, is that the same? I go through weird spells of how I can write, <laughs> what times of day. I would say I'm most fresh in the mornings, but lately I find time to. I find I can write in the afternoons and what and the most rare for me is at night. So I'd say that usually when I do write, it's in the mornings, in the afternoons, not at not around noon, not around um, five or six o'clock usually. You know, those are usually your eating hours. Um, but I wish I could be the guy who gets up at 4.30 and writes from 4.30 to 8, 8 a.m. As, as often as I tell myself, you should do that, you really need to have that happen, <laughs> it never happens. How important is it for people in our audience or just the average person to buy one of these books? Because, you know, if you think about it, 15, 20 bucks, 12 bucks, it's not that expensive. How important is it for you? Well, it's everything for me as a writer because there's a measure of success with book sales for what, what I'm doing and for my goals as, as a writer and reaching higher and higher tier, tiers. It's going to be about sales for me. So, so I do need to sell, sell books. But on a whole nother level, it's important to that community we were talking about. If you publish a book, well, Savag, I've known you for three years. If I don't buy your book, you're going to be kind of offended. You're going to say, Nick, you're not coming on my show again. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're good. I'm, I'm unfriending you on Facebook, man. So I think that there's this sort of community that develops between writers and just people in, in general who, who need to connect with each other. And, uh, and it's done through the purchase of these books. We can't just give them away, unfortunately, to everybody. You know, they, there's a cost in, in, in making this product. Do you find that people expect that? I mean, I, I could imagine that as a writer, if you carry on 100 books, someone will say, hey, give me one. You know, it's not going to hurt you. You know what? I don't mind giving away books once in a while. You know, I even gave a book away when I, I came here. I think I gave it to your sister, actually. Yeah, in the studio. And I think you were jealous. Yeah, in the studio. Like, Why yeah, where's my book, Nick? Where's my book? <laughs> I have other crew members. That's no, I'm, true, just playing. I'm just playing. Um, you, you know, I think it's okay to give some books yeah. away. And, it, and it was part, of, part of what you do is you give them to media because the media are the people that you want excited about your books because they have radio shows and TV shows and things like that. So there's a, there's a give and take there. And then the people who aren't in the media, sometimes people can't afford a book, but they want one really bad, and, and you know that, and so you give them one. And that's okay. Sometimes they're a friend. But even friends need to support each other too. So, so you know, I still I still got to sell. You know. Yeah. How can people find out more information about you? I mean, give them your Facebook page, your Twitter, and all the other stuff because you post some interesting stuff. And you know what I feel like is every time I open my Facebook, I'm following you around because you put some pretty cool pictures up. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, when I was working for ABC, I was getting a lot of stuff on the homepage of CNN, and that included photos. So 
I have a natural love for taking photos and, and I have this cool lens for my iPhone. I saw that. Like it's the that. first time I've ever seen that lens, by the way. And I'm going to copy you. I'm going to buy one of those lenses. Yeah, you can take photos of bugs and all kinds of cool things with, uh, with lenses like that. So, so people can follow me, Nick Bellardis, uh, N-I-C-K-B-E-L-A-R-D-E-S. So you can search for me on, on Twitter or on Facebook. Those are the ways you can really follow me. I'm building a website at nicholasbellardis.com, but it's sort of under construction. Um, but that's going to be a way. You can, I'm really going to start blogging a lot there. So, so, and of course, you can go to my publisher, vivaeditions.com, or you can go to lummexpress.com and, and find my poetry book there, too. So... Is it okay to shop around to publishers? I mean, let's say that you have this book and one publisher wants it and they get it. Is it okay? I mean, is there like an unspoken rule that you don't do that? Or let's say that you, you have a publisher that is next door to you and they haven't bought or bought into your book. Is it okay to go sell them it? Well, that's called simultaneous submissions. You're sending your work out to more, which is smart for your, you wrote a novel and you want it to get published. And if you don't have an agent, and this is what your agent should be doing anyways. If you do have an agent, they send your book out to, you know, 15 to 20 different publishers and they let them know, say, hey, this is under simultaneous submission. And as long as you let them know that, then if, if you know, maybe three people are interested in it and then you have three opportunities, you see which deal is the best, right? We are running out of time. So you have a couple of seconds to tell your audience something about you that we haven't covered yet. Oh, goodness. Well, I really hope that people connect with me on Facebook and Twitter because there's a lot of conversations that we can have uh, together to help build community. And I, you know, I, I just want to go back to that. Building writing community is one of the most important things to me. And I think the Valley really needs that. You know, this is a Valley show and the Valley writing community needs to continue to grow. And if, if you want to connect with me, can connect with me. and Maybe we can find ways to do that together. Thank you so much for coming on the program this week. Thank you. That's all for this edition of San Joaquin Spotlight. Our guest this week is Nick Bellardis. He's an author, and he does a lot of cool things. And you can follow him on Twitter or find his Facebook page. Thank you to the volunteer crew that made this and every production possible. Thank you to our friends at 90.7 FM KFSR Fresno. And most importantly, thank you for watching and listening to this broadcast on TV or on the radio. I'm your host, Sevak Tatiosian. Next week, we'll be back with a new edition. <laughs>